Hello, welcome back to Meraki Unboxed. My name's Simon Thompson. Super happy once again to have you with us. Hope you're doing well. And today we've got a session which I think you're going to find really exciting because we're here to talk about a brand new product line at Cisco Meraki. And I love it when this happens. We launch these every couple of years or so. We've got something brand new that's addressing a new problem. And that is exactly what we're here to talk about today. We'll get into that in just a moment. Before we get started, I just want to remind you, Meraki Unboxed is a podcast we run every couple of weeks. We put these out on a Wednesday every two weeks. So you'll find a great selection of content that we've already recorded if you just go back through the archive. This stuff ages really well. I mean, there's very little that we've recorded that's really out of date. So if you're interested in learning more about Cisco Meraki, I definitely recommend you have a look through the archive. We've got uh, 36 episodes. I think this is the 37th we're putting out. And you'll find something to interest you from our portfolio and what we do at Meraki for sure. I'm very confident of that. If you'd like to be featured on the Meraki Unboxed podcast, we'd love to have you on as a guest, or we'd love to just hear your ideas for what you'd like to hear for an episode. So do please reach out to me. As always, my Twitter account is at Meraki Simon, and you can find me easily there. I'm there most days, uh, easy to get hold of. And just let me know what you think and what you'd like to contribute, or even if you'd like to take part, that would be super awesome. I would be very happy to welcome you onto the podcast. Okay, so our guest today is a very exciting new member of the Meraki team who is here to introduce uh, this exciting new product portfolio. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over and introduce Anthony. Anthony, good morning. Hey, good morning, Simon. Great to be here today. I just realized not everybody, it won't be morning for everybody who's listening. It's morning as we're recording it, Friday morning, end of the week. We've been working hard and recording a podcast is just a great way to start a Friday, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. It's been a great productive week. It's a great way to close out the week. And a pretty exciting one for you as well, because uh, this is the week where Cisco did its big launch event, including these new products. So I know you've been extremely busy. So thanks for taking the time out to join us today. Uh, why don't you start off with a quick introduction? Love to hear you know, who you are, what you do for Meraki, and also just give us a little bit of background about yourself and what you've been doing before you came and joined us. Sure, Simon. Yeah. So for everybody that doesn't know me, I'm Anthony Kizan. I'm the product manager at Meraki, working on our newest product line, MT. Yeah, as you said, it's been super exciting because we just publicly announced this new product line uh, after all this time of research and development. Really excited to have the team finally release this product after all their hard work. To tell you a little bit more about myself before I came to Meraki, so I came to Meraki at the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. So I've been here for about 10 months now. Before that, I was also at another IoT company. I was working at a company called UMA doing residential smart security. So also working on battery powered IoT devices designed to protect people's homes against intrusion, robbery, that kind of thing. So it was a really great transition coming to Meraki and also working on similar sensors, but this mm. time on the enterprise side. Yeah, And then before that, I was at Stanford studying electrical engineering and management science and engineering. So I've been spending a good amount of time here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I feel for you having had the majority of your time at Meraki working from home, I guess, and you certainly probably didn't plan it that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people are in the same boat as us working through this pandemic, but it's still been all the same, though, with all these collaboration tools that we've been able to work with. It's still been great working with a team. I did have the luxury of being able to work in person in the office mm -hmm. for about four months before the quarantine. Yeah. And, and what an amazing thing that you've managed to get a product launched even during this thing. So let's get into it and tell us what this thing is. First of all, let's understand exactly what we're talking about today. So we're calling the product line MT, and just to give some context about that, T in MT stands for things, as in Internet of Things. So trying to be a little bit fun and clever mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. I see what um, you did start there. <laughs> yeah, and phase one of MT, we're looking at protecting existing Meraki customers' equipment in their server rooms and their network closets. So going after the kinds of customers that Meraki already has today. So we've got big plans for MT in phase two and beyond. This is our use case. This is our beachhead for mm -hmm. MT that we're looking to expand upon. And with that context, our first three MT models are MT10, a temperature and humidity sensor, MT12, a water leak sensor, and MT20, a door open, close, and intrusion sensor. And really what we're looking for here is to protect all the equipment in those spaces that I mentioned, the server room and the network closet, 
against any environmentals that could cause loss, downtime, or damage. So this is where we're starting. Awesome. And I think it's really important to just clarify that point that I know you set about to really address a very specific use case that you had in mind. So that's obviously important because these things could be used in all kinds of different settings. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously that was deliberate. And why did we choose to go after that specifically? Was there any specific thinking behind that? Yeah, that's a really insightful question, Simon. So with IoT, the world is your oyster. There's so many IoT devices out there. IoT is not new. It's been around for decades. And it can be really confusing to get into the space and try to figure out what the right solution is for you. Mm -hmm. For MT, we wanted to make it super simple, not only to use, but also to understand what it's for and what the use case is. Not only for the customer, but also for our sales team as they're learning to sell this product line. We wanted to have it hyper-focused, super easy to consume and understand. In order to make it simple, we're going after our existing customer base because they're going to be the ones that are most interested in this brand new product line. Right. And that's important because I'm trying to think about that context of how this fits into everything else we do. Obviously, we're mostly known for the networking and security side of things. But of course, recently, a few years ago now, I said recently, I've been around too long. Um, a few years ago now, we introduced the cameras. And uh, obviously, that was quite a departure from our traditional product lines up to that point. And you know, there's, there's a reason for this. All of these things actually do play together pretty well by helping IT organizations with what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, so I think one of the things I was interested to kind of ask you about was getting into IoT. And this is an exciting area, but it's one we've been hearing about in the consumer world for years at this point. And it's been a sort of one of those buzzy terms that gets thrown around for a long time. So you'd think that by now we'd already have all of the IoT solutions we need. So why are we venturing into this space? Yeah, you're exactly right. When you go into trade shows these days, it seems like there's all sorts of IoT devices. Everything in IoT has already been built. Why would you get into this space if it seems like there's nothing new to be brought in? Mm -hmm. One of my favorite stories that I heard from my colleague, George Bentink, who also is in the product management organization at Meraki, he was at one of these trade shows. And as he was taking a look at the exhibits, he was able to find a LoRaWAN wireless connected mousetrap that would tell you if a mouse was caught or not and it's time to empty that mousetrap and wow. reset it um, you know, via the cloud. And George said to himself, oh, I think everything in IoT has already been built. So, <laughs> so I think we've reached saturation in the IoT market. Oh dear, now so I've got this that... gruesome picture in my mind, but uh, let's move on swiftly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So with that in mind, the reason why we're entering the saturated market is because even though everything's already been built, it's not all simple. It hasn't been built well. And right. at Meraki, we're all about simplifying things. And we know that looking at this market, we can deliver a much better experience to the customers than what they're already getting today. Mm -hmm. We're seeing things for these IoT connected devices. The, the customer has to jump through all sorts of hoops to get them set up. Sure, they connect to the internet and they're able to deliver notifications for the various things that they're sensing, but you have to stand up your own on-premise server. And a lot of times these on-premise servers, they run on an old version of Windows or Linux mm -hmm. and lots of IT teams are lean and they, ha they have a boatload of responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis. And the last thing they wanna do is spend cycles out of their day maintaining an on-premise server. And if it goes down, they lose all their visibility of their sensors and having to get that back up again. That's just something that they would like to remove from their list of responsibilities. On top of that, provisioning and setup is not simple. You have to do things like setting up a dedicated SSID to manage only the sensors and no other devices can live on that SSID. Mm -hmm. You have to manually provision IP addresses for each of your sensors. Just a lot of headache, a lot of extra busy work that we wanted to take away from the customer. And we thought the perfect solution is the Meraki platform, the, the Meraki yep. cloud and do all of this for the customer. So th that's exactly what we're looking to do. We want to simplify IoT. And of course, this is one of the areas where we're basically repeating a trick that we've performed previously at Meraki in the sense that we have eliminated certain pieces of infrastructure that were needed historically or were traditionally expected to be there, like a wireless LAN controller. And in the case of the cameras, the network video recorder, those things we just don't need because we're leveraging the cloud backend. So we've performed the same trick again right here. Yeah, exactly. We've come up with a verbiage of Meraki-ifying things. It's just our MO at Meraki is uh, simplifying everything. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Yeah. 
And I think one of the interesting areas here as well is the sort of communication technology that's being used. And so we should talk about how this works and how our own approach is different from a communication standpoint. And you mentioned a protocol called LoRaWAN earlier, and I'm going to guess because I needed to look this up a couple of weeks ago. I didn't know about it. I'm going to guess most people listening probably haven't come across LoRaWAN. Maybe you could just give us some context of the protocols that used in this space and how we're doing it differently. Uh, sure. So we are using Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE for short. It is a 2.4 gigahertz protocol, so it's in the same frequency space as your Wi-Fi. So Bluetooth Low Energy is a pretty popular standard these days. There's a lot of devices using this protocol. So it's pretty well documented. Lots of developers are using it the, these days. We decided to use it because we already had BLE technology mm -hmm. in our MR Wi-Fi APs and also in our uh, second generation MV cameras. So that infrastructure was already there. We announced earlier this year, people that had been purchasing our MRs and MVs, all of a sudden, it's almost like an Easter egg. You, you purchased this, you didn't know it was in there, and now we're unlocking it for you to use. So nice little Easter egg and feature for our customers to realize that they could use this now. Mm -hmm. So this protocol, we decided to go wireless instead of having our sensors be wired in order to give our customers flexibility in terms of where they want to mount these sensors. And for our application here, where we're looking to cover not extremely long distances, we're looking to cover indoor spaces, inside carpeted office buildings, and in these server rooms and network closets. BLE was perfect for this application. You'll hear about other ones out there, like Z-Wave, Zigbee, LoRaWAN. LoRaWAN, for example, is a very long-range application, right. but we didn't need to go through the trouble of implementing that in our system, so we didn't implement that for, for phase one. Yeah. We can talk all day about these wireless standards, but yeah, that's kind of the reasoning why we went with BLE. Yeah, well, if there's one thing I've learned in this game, it's that every uh, communication protocol and medium that you use has pros and cons. So I think the reuse of a technology that we've been using at several years now at Meraki, the BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, seems like a really good choice. It's almost like a free available protocol that we can sort of piggyback off the back of for Meraki customers. And of course, it's very convenient for keeping it wireless. I think that's one of the things I really like about this. And I should say, I, uh, Anthony was kind enough to supply me with one of these uh, sensors to try out. So I've got that set up myself and it was incredibly easy. And, you know, it's got great range and, and is uh, helping me to know if a particular door is opening or closing and, uh, you know, great little solution to try out and so easy to set up. And maybe let's try and actually paint that picture, uh, Anthony, like the unboxing experience and how, how quickly and easily this is to, to set up because it was incredibly impressive to me. Yeah, what we have here is an end-to-end -end solution. With sensor deployments, you need the sensor itself. You need some sort of gateway to provide connectivity to that sensor and mm -hmm. deliver that data to the cloud, and you need some sort of management platform. For MT, Meraki owns all three pieces of that deployment. The sensor and the gateways, I mentioned we were using the MR and MB gateways, mm -hmm. um, and we also have the management platform through the Meraki dashboard. And so having this all-in-one end-to-end solution uh, all under one roof allows us to do is make the out-of-box experience uh, very simple. All you have to do is open the box for one of the MTs, put in the battery that we include. By the way, we're using AA user-replaceable batteries. It's really easy to find AA's anywhere. You can find them in any supermarket. And they last but, a long time, right? Yeah, they last a really long time. So off of a single charge, you can get up to five years of battery life. It's amazing. I, I mentioned it's super easy to find these. You won't have to do that for five years because we include that battery out of the box. Right. Once you power it on by putting that battery in there, then all you have to do is add that sensor to any network that has a second generation MV or a Wi-Fi 6 MR. And then MT will do the rest. The device will find the best gateway to connect to. And then that gateway will all of a sudden start using its existing M-Tunnel connection mm -hmm. to the Meraki cloud and start delivering that sensor data to the cloud. And you'll be seeing that data in your Meraki dashboard immediately. Yep. And you can set up alerts and be informed based on thresholds as well, right? Yeah, that's correct. A big part of the solution that we've built out is our real-time alerting platform. We know that when these sensors are alerting, when somebody's experiencing extreme heat, extreme humidities in their spaces, or if they're detecting water, intruding in their spaces. We know that these are potentially catastrophic situations that are happening in these spaces where the IT team is sending people 
immediately to rectify these solutions. Otherwise, it could mean large expense in terms of downtime for their network. Right. We know that when these are alerting, time is of the essence. And we don't just want to be delivering that data to customers' dashboards in the off chance that they'll be looking at the dashboard. We also want to deliver that data directly to their email inboxes and also to their mobile phones in the form of mobile push mm -hmm. and SMS notifications. So that's all configurable in dashboard. I can also speak more about that as well. Oh, yeah. Well, I think the floor is yours. So share anything you'd like. And I think we're definitely interested in these use cases. I'm sure that folks listening want to really understand how we see these being used. Maybe just talk us through the scenario, paint a picture for us. When you're designing these, where are you picturing them being used predominantly by our customers? That's a good call out that we should verbally paint a picture because I'm used to speaking with slides. Right. The listeners here don't have that luxury of a picture can say a, a thousand words, but <laughs> unfortunately, this is an audio podcast. So that's a good reminder. There. You, can, you can do a so, thousand words, Anthony. That's fine. No problem. We've got all that. <laughs> <laughs> For our listeners, I guess, let's put ourselves in the shoes of an IT director. So you're in charge of the networking infrastructure for the company that you work for. And imagine that you have a number of spaces like server rooms, network closets, what they call MDFs and IDFs. So in these spaces, they ha you have racks and racks of equipment and use including routers, switches that are providing network connectivity for all the devices, uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of devices in, in that space. Mm -hmm. Imagine yourself walking in through the door leading into that network closet. Yep. For some of them, these are very well curated spaces. These are HVAC controlled, very secure spaces. But for some other customers, perhaps they are a public sector customer working for the State Department and the building that that operation resides in was built a long time ago. It was built before computer networking was even a consideration. So they might not have the latest and the greatest HVAC systems. They might have had to stash some of their networking equipment in any space they could find available, a broom closet or a janitorial closet, what have you. Definitely, definitely. I remember that, definitely. And uh, I say, hands up, anybody who's listening who has to manage a network that's essentially in a cupboard of some sort. It's going to be somebody out there who's going to put their hand up. So yes, definitely familiar yeah. with uh, that. And it's not always that luxurious situation we picture when we see it on TV with all flashing lights and air conditioning and so on. Yeah, exactly. That's what we like to see. And we like to idealize these spaces, but not everybody has that luxury and they have to go with whatever space they can find available. A lot of these customers are worried that, hey, I don't have um, a key card access door protecting that space. I just have uh, whatever door and there's, it's not even locked most of the time. Or again, I don't have a proper HVAC or I'm concerned about the quality of the plumbing around this space. Any small leak can intrude in the space and potentially cause problems with my network stack. Mm -hmm. Perhaps during inclement weather, there can be water leaking in from the roof. Even in small amounts, small amounts of water can be potentially catastrophic. So you want to monitor for all these things as you're walking in through the door of that closet. You think to yourself, oh, I, I would really love to know if anybody besides me or any of my colleagues on my team enters this space. Um, I'd love to put a sensor on this door to let me know that it's been opened. When you take a look at all the racks in that room, you might think to yourself, oh, I want to put a, a sensor on each of these rack doors to let me know which specific rack door was opened in right. the case of hone in on which one was tampered with. So in terms of temperature and humidity, you might want to be monitoring for high temperatures because high temperatures obviously lead to performance degradation on your electronics. Uh, that's where MT10 comes into play, monitoring for high temperature. For humidity, the reason why we're monitoring for humidity is high humidity can lead to condensation buildup, which could then lead to electrical shorts on your equipment right. that could essentially destroy your equipment. Low humidity can actually promote the risk of electrostatic discharge. So when you take a look at a lot of this equipment, not only will it say, okay, the maximum humidity you should be operating at is 90% relative humidity. Uh, there's also a lower bound, like a lot of the equipment mm -hmm. will say, you shouldn't operate this under 15% relative humidity. So the reason for that is electrostatic discharge. Wow. Um, I learned something today. I didn't, I've never heard that one before. I definitely yeah. always thought high humidity has got to be bad because you're getting into moisture and condensation and all those kind of problems. But low humidity, that's a new one for me. A lot of IT professionals have actually told us that uh, low humidity is a problem for them. They're doing things like purchasing anti-static floor mats to prevent uh, that from building mm -hmm. up. 
they have grounding mats underneath some of this equipment that go to ground to bleed off any of that extra electrical charge to reduce that risk, that, that kind of thing. So this has been carefully thought out, and I like that. I, I must admit, when I looked at the sensors, I, I didn't actually realize, I didn't really think about the humidity aspect on that temperature sensor. So that's really interesting. So we're covering moisture in two ways, essentially, the humidity in the air, but also obviously the leak detection, as you said. And, and it's certainly easy to visualize these communication rooms that have these suboptimal environments. And I think it's more common than we would really like it to be. As you said, so many of us would picture those idealized scenarios with the beautiful air conditioning and row upon row of neatly dressed uh, server racks. But the reality is often very different. And of course, certain parts of the world with real environmental challenges, these can be a real lifesaver. Maybe let's go on from the theory then, because that's the theory of what we're anticipating these being used as. Let's think about some of the early adopters of these products as we've gone through their development and now their launch. Maybe walk us through any stories you've heard about the actual use of these in the field. Oh, wow. Uh, it's going to be hard to pick one because we've <laughs> had a lot of successful stories with our early field trials and our, and our beta customers. So it's been really exciting. And thanks to all our beta customers that have been uh, trying this out and giving us feedback. One of the ones that I want to call out here is Bossa Nova Robotics. They're a beta customer. We got them set up with some early units and they helped us debug and use them for the first time. To tell you about Boston Nova Robotics, they are a high-tech robotics company. They're based in Pennsylvania, but they also have a facility here in the Bay in Mountain View. They build these uh, retail analytics robots, and you can imagine uh, robots on wheels that rove up and down supermarket aisles like Walmart, scanning barcodes, scanning inventory on the shelves of that supermarket, and they're doing things like uh, inventory management. So really cool value proposition for that company, for a pretty exciting company to be working with. Wow. So there were a number of reasons why they were interested in MT. They had an existing sensor solution to monitor their critical network stack in their headquarters and in their various offices. So the existing solution was completely separate from their existing infrastructure. They had to go to a completely different machine to be able to look at it and manage it. And they just wanted something that was closer to their IT team that their IT team could just manage in a single pane of glass. So Bossa Nova was already a Meraki customer and they loved the idea that they could use the very same Meraki dashboard that they're already using to manage their MX routers or MS switches and all of their other Meraki equipment. Just one click away, they could also manage their MTs. Mm -hmm. That's a big call out that we're using the same Meraki dashboard that our customers already know and love. And that was a big selling point for them. The other reason why they were interested in MT was because they wanted to do some smart things with their other internet-connected devices. In, in their case, they have an internet-connected HVAC system, and they wanted to be able to do things like when my temperature sensors uh, sense high temperatures, automatically turn on my HVAC system via API. And a lot of competing sensor solutions don't do that, but we do. Uh, everything at Meraki we do on the dashboard is API first. So that was an API endpoint that we could provide to them. And so we fit the bill for them on that front as well. Awesome. The API story is a really interesting one. We covered that in the last couple of episodes, actually. So if anybody's interested in learning more about the API side of things, as Anthony said, we're now API first at Cisco Meraki. Uh, which just means that we're making it easier for people to connect to the capabilities of all of these products through their own software solutions. So go back and have a look at those if you're interested or have a listen, I should say, to any of those. But Anthony, please carry on. I'm glad you brought that up because it is a very important point. Um, so just to be clear, uh, APIs, webhooks, they are not an afterthought for our engineering team as they build out that functionality. Everything, all the endpoints that you're seeing in dashboard as you use our software are built on APIs. It's kind of interwoven together as we do that development work. In order for us to be able to display it on our own dashboard, we use the APIs. After that, we turn around and also make those APIs available for our customers to consume as well. It's very much integrated into our workflow as we build those out. Mm -hmm. And so the third and uh, last reason that I wanted to call out Bossa Nova was interested in Meraki was because, uh, of course, in the COVID reality that we're living in today with everyone working from home during the quarantine, they had fewer people in the office to keep an eye on the critical networking stack that they had in their physical spaces. So they wanted to have that remote visibility. And the best way to do that is with IoT sensors. 
that's where we're looking to build out with these sensors, um, giving people eyes and ears on the ground when they can't physically be there. So with all that said, we got them set up with some empty sensors. They set them up in the spaces that I described earlier, temperature and humidity, water, door intrusion in their network uh, rooms. And a few weeks later, they called us up and let us know that we stopped a potentially catastrophic issue from happening for them. One day, they had a power outage in their facility. And when the power came back on, all of their systems came back on, uh, their critical networking infrastructure. But the thing that did not come back on was their HVAC system. Mm. And unfortunately, they didn't have a backup HVAC system. And they essentially experienced a cooling failure. So then MT all of a sudden started sending them alerts that temperature was rising. It ultimately hit a temperature of 134 degrees Fahrenheit in that space. Ouch. Very, very bad for any sort of equipment in there. They sent somebody in to uh, go ahead and confirm the situation that was happening. Uh, yeah, it was very easy to confirm that there was a problem. They started uh, opening windows and doors, getting everything to cool down. They told us that if MT had not been there, they would have lost approximately $30,000 worth of equipment. Oof. So so very painful. But $30,000 in terms of loss is actually on the small end of the spectrum for them. Mm. Uh, what would have been a much more was the downtime that they would have experienced as they were in the process of replacing all that equipment, getting it back online. They would have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in development time for their operation. So big win for us in being able to save the day for Bossa Nova. Yeah, you can easily see how the avoidance of cost is a significant part of an installation like this. And and given the cost of these sensors, I mean, it's a, almost a no-brainer from an insurance perspective. So uh, really nice to hear. And in fact, uh, the Bossa Nova story was also relayed by Todd from Bossa Nova Robotics on a recent launch event that Cisco recorded. Uh, when was that? October, I think around October 20th, we did a presentation online uh, introducing these sensors to the world. And a recording of that is now available. And I'll put a link in the description of this podcast. So if you want to go and check that recording out and listen to the customers themselves, uh, then you have the opportunity to absolutely do that. So thanks for that story. I mean, that's that's definitely a really good one. I'm sure that there are folks on here who are saying, okay, this sounds awesome. You've won me over. How do I now go about trying them out? So what's the story there? So give us a call. We would love to get you set up with a trial with our sensors uh, if you're not already sold on, on buying them outright. We're currently doing 90-day trials for MT. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is for you to go ahead and see for yourself, put these in your spaces, um, see what kind of value you can, you can get out of them. We're also running a promotion first year on us. So when you purchase your license, say you purchase a five-year license, with this first year on us promotion, we'll also give you the first year for free. Nice. Um, so give us a call. We're standing by to set you up with sensors. <laughs> Excellent pitch. I like it a lot. And yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool that we're doing a 90-day trial as well. That's a good length of time to really see what kind of impact these can have in your space. So I think that was a nice decision as well. Um, what's next, Anthony? So there's always something to look forward to with technology. So um, where do you see it going from here? There's so many ways we can go with MT. So we're definitely looking at other use cases outside of the network closet and the server room. I can't divulge too much now, mm -hmm. but uh, what I can say is that we've built a platform here that's very scalable. So with our MTs, our devices essentially consist of a microcontroller unit, a Bluetooth antenna, a battery or some sort of power element, and then a port that can lead to any sensing element. The three sensing elements that we have used for MT10, 12, and 20 are essentially a thermistor and a humidity detector mm -hmm. for MT10, a water leak sensor, so that's a binary wet dry detector on MT12, and then a magnetometer on MT20 that senses magnetic field strength. To be specific, we're using a, a Hall effect sensor. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine it was very easy to do that, to swap out the sensing element for these first three. You can imagine we could just attach other sensing elements for phase two and beyond, our fourth, our fifth, our, our, our sixth MTs out there. We're very excited. We've built out a platform that we think we can iterate on and build and turn out additional MTs with uh, just some incremental changes, leveraging the architecture that we've already built today. That's exciting. And, and I'm sure there are folks listening who will be having 
uh, ideas and asking themselves, what about this sensor? What about this idea? And uh, and the truth is that we're always listening. Uh, there are plenty of ways to provide feedback, obviously directly through the Meraki dashboard. That's one of the ways you can do it. Uh, but if you are interested in a particular type of sensor, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are. So you can reach out to us in all kinds of different ways. You can ping me on Twitter if you like. Um, otherwise, you can just uh, reach out to our regular sales contacts and uh, whatever works for you, whatever contact you have. I'm safe in saying, Anthony, that you're, you'll be listening to any ideas that you, uh, that you get back from our, uh, our field and our customer users. Yeah, definitely. I'll just share quickly that the way we recruited our beta customers was we took a look at all of our existing customers that pressed the make a wish button uh -huh. on our Meraki dashboard. We, we saw wishes coming in like, I wish I could monitor the temperature and humidity of my Meraki equipment. A lot of people don't realize that we actually read those. Mm -hmm. And when we gave them a call, they were like, oh, my God, <laughs> you're here to grab me my wish. And so, yeah, that made for a very fun interaction. So, yes, we are definitely listening. If you're an existing Meraki customer, hit that make a wish button, give us a call. And we're looking to solve people's needs and, and grant their wishes. I love that. We're removing that skepticism. Those things do get read. And what an awesome way to do product development. We're completely responding to the customer's needs. And it's a nice way to really understand where the demand is as well. And I think when you start to see the same kind of requests coming in over and over again, you know that you're onto something and that there's potential for a product or a feature to address that. That's really good to hear. Okay, well, Anthony, I think this has been a really exciting walk into this brand new product line. What is this, our sixth or seventh product line at Meraki? So I think that what's really cool here is that, again, we have taken something which is kind of messy and a little bit difficult to get set up in the real world, this IoT concept. It sounds so good and the ideas all work extremely nicely, but when you actually deploy it in the real world, there's still a lot of mess to work through. And once again, we've come along, we've kind of removed that altogether because you've already got this technology in place that's going to relay the communication from the sensors. So why not take advantage of that? Really great idea. And I can't wait to see uh, what your team comes up with next. Thanks very much for joining us, Anthony. Thank you very much, Simon. It was great to be here. Okay, so that was Meraki Unboxed, and what an exciting episode that was. Uh, please do uh, check out that link in the description where you can have a look at the recording of the, the session where Cisco launched all of this stuff, and there are also some other industrial-focused IoT sensors uh, from the Cisco family you might want to check out as well in that introduction. Uh, so from Anthony and me, I think it's time we wrap things up for another Meraki Unbox session. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, once again, don't forget to reach out with any ideas you've got for sessions. Otherwise, we'll see you back here in two weeks. Stay safe, stay well, and have a great day. Bye for now.